Hi. Welcome to the fifth episode of our talks about distribution agreements worldwide, dedicated to Denmark. Our speaker today is Peter Gregerson, interviewed by Roberto Luzzi Crivellini. In this episode, they'll discuss how distribution agreements are regulated in Denmark, what are the important clauses in these agreements, what are the main issues in distribution agreements and how to prevent or manage conflicts. Make sure you follow Legal Mondo on LinkedIn and YouTube to stay updated on the next episodes. Hi, Peter. Thank you for joining us in this uh, series of talks about uh, distribution agreements worldwide. So today we discuss Denmark and I would start our chat by asking you how are distribution agreements regulated in your country? Yes. Um, so generally speaking, when we talk distribution, that covers a wide, a wide variety of, of, uh, of contracts. But I would say that, of course, the most common ones are uh, distributors and agents. So we distinguish between those two um, in the sense that a distributor is somebody who um, buys products from a supplier and then resell them in his own name and for his own account. So that's a distributor. And then uh, an agent is defined in the same way as an agent is under the EU directive. Um, so you can just rely on that definition when you consider whether you are dealing with an agent or distributor in Denmark. Um, so I think those are the two um, sort of most important uh, sort of uh, ways of distributing uh, your products in Denmark. Um, and as far as legislation uh, is concerned, then there is no specific reg um, legislation relating to uh, distributors. So that means that generally you operate under the freedom of contract as both parties would be considered uh, professional parties, then you can agree uh, within the limits of, of, um, of competition law anyway, you can agree to whatever you want to basically. Um, as long as it's, of course, not grossly unfair to to uh, to one party. Um, so so that's pretty easy when it comes to to uh, distributors. Uh, when you talk about agents, then again, you know, no surprise to most people, Denmark is a member of the EU, and therefore we have implemented an act. Uh, well, we've implemented the directive in an in an in an act. Um, so so that that governs um, commercial agents. Okay, thank you, and. Uh... Okay, this is noted. And uh, how about um, um, any case law that maybe is uh, relevant for uh, for those who do uh, distribution agreements or agency in Denmark that is worth mentioning? Yes. Um, again, starting with the distributors, I would say that one thing that's that's very important is that, as I said, we don't have have any specific rules for distributors, and that also means that you cannot apply the uh, the rules on agencies uh, to come to distribution agreements so most importantly that means that as a, a that that if you terminate a distribution contract um, the distributor will not be able to make any claim for what we usually refer to as indemnity or goodwill compensation right there's there there's a few uh, situation, old case law, a few examples where there, there was some some goodwill compensation, but I would say that that is you know dead and buried. That is not something you should worry about if you terminate a distribution contract uh, in Denmark. On the other hand, of course, if you're dealing with with agents, then if you meet the requirements under the directive, being the most important ones that the directive, uh, sorry, that the agent has either uh, obtained uh, new customers or expanded the the, the trade with current customers and it's equitable and so on and so forth, then um, the agent may be entitled to um, a, uh, an indemnity under the, under, the, under the directive or more specifically, uh, in this case, the Danish Act implementing the directive. Okay, thanks. Um, um, based on your experience and you've seen a number of distribution agreements in your career, what are the, the main issues that tend to come up in a distributorship agreement or in an agency agreement with a foreign manufacturer? And uh, what are your uh, tips, uh, the tips you would share, um, again, from, from practical viewpoint uh, when drafting an, a, a contract or during the life uh, of the contract, so managing an ongoing agreement that one should uh, consider? 
Yeah. Um, so with distributors, I mean, usually I don't see a lot of issues when they work together because it is basically, you know, buy and sell uh, corporation. And it's, you know, some, some contracts are, of course, most sophisticated with standard operation and procedures and a lot of reporting requirements and, and all of that. So, uh, but I don't think usually that's not a really big issue in distribution agreements. Uh, sometimes, of course, you have um, minimum purchase obligations on the distributor. Uh, and of course, for those, you have to be very specific um, as to, is it just targets or is it uh, a minimum requirement, a true obligation? Because if there's case law that suggests that if it's just um, a target, then not attaining the target will not be a breach or a material breach by the distributor. And of course, if it is not, then you cannot terminate the, 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 the agreement for, for costs. So that's very important to be very specific. And also, the, as I, again, the consequences of, of not reaching this, because one may be that you, you, are, you are allowed to, to terminate, uh, the supplier is, is allowed to terminate the, the agreement uh, upon immediate notice. It may also be if you contract that into the agreement that you can uh, you can just terminate the exclusivity if this if it's an exclusive contract so that you the the the, the agreement remains in place but it's no longer exclusive. Um, so so those are the things that you need to be very specific about. Um, and then um, and then also the the notice period again. As a, as a general rule, you know, there's the freedom of contract. So you can basically agree um, for the notice period, unless it's, it's uh, grossly unfair to the distributor. But usually you would, you would expect that a, uh, a distribution agreement can be terminated upon six months notice. Yeah. And if, if you have, you know, some of the issues that do arise is that if you have a distribution agreement, but if it is oral, then you have not agreed on the on the on the termination notice and that is sometimes an issue so what termination notice applies if you have not made any agreement on that specific question and and in denmark you you say that you have to give uh well either party has to receive a reasonable notice what is reasonable well of course it depends on the sort of the very nature of the of the corporation you know sometimes a distributor will represent you know five different brands so you can say, then he does not depend on one specific brand, um, and and, um, and and but the most important sort of um, parameter when you consider what is reasonable is for how long did the parties cooperate? And generally, you can say that if if they have had this uh, cooperation for like you know three four years, then you should give three months notice, uh, and if it's been more than that you should give six months notice. Yeah. Now, I know in some, in some jurisdictions, you can end up with very, very long termination notices um, if you've been a distributor like 40 years. But we have case law in Denmark. Well, actually, somebody who was a distributor for 42 years and they were terminated upon uh, six months notice. And then the Supreme Court said that's sufficient. I mean, six months, it doesn't matter if you've been a distributor for five, 10 or 40 years. Um, you can still, you know, find a new supplier of similar products and terminate any employees you need to terminate and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's fair. You, you can do six months is sufficient. So that, I think that's very important for, for, um, for, for, uh, for other people to know that that is considered a reasonable termination notice in Denmark for distributors. Yeah, it, it happened to me in the past that for a distribution contract in Spain that was lasting for uh, 27 years, uh, a local court would consider that 24 months would be a, um, a reasonable notice period. Yeah. But that was also uh, tied to the fact that the distributor had put in place several important investments to service uh, yes. The, yes, the, the, the principal. And in that case, and, and that was kind of agreed with the principal, then there was six months or even 12 months would not be considered sufficient as to uh, you know, amortize those investments and then uh, find another reasonable position on the market. So yeah, yeah. thanks for pointing but, that but out. No, so that, that's, that's a bit interesting, interesting what you say there because 
in Denmark, you would you you would still be able to terminate upon six months notice, but but when you get to the question of damages, not not related directly to the notice period, but you're right. I mean, we have some examples that let's say that the supplier requires from the distributor to make certain investments that you know they would be amortized over you no know, reasonable uh, period of time. But let's say you require that that distributor to invest a couple of million, and that would usually, if if you have to have a you know reasonable profit over time, um, then you could, as a supplier, become liable if you terminate upon let's say six months' notice. But if you just require the distributor to make a huge investment that cannot be sort of amortized over reasonably amortized over like six months, then you could be you could be liable for that loss. And the same also if you have an obligation on the distributor to have sort of a minimum, a minimum stock of products. Let's say that that minimum is of such um, scope that it would be impossible for the distributor to sell off that stock in during the notice period or a reasonable time thereafter. Then a court might also say, well, I mean, if if it is the supply who imposed that obligation on the distributor. And the distributor is unable to sell off these products, then they either would have to buy the stock back, or they would have to um, compensate the, the distributor for the loss suffered because of being stuck with this with this um, with this stock. Yeah. Okay. And and, and then now still we're only talking distributors. Uh, we haven't even touched upon sort of uh, your question in relation to to uh, agents. Um, and I'll, I'll say that I mean. Uh, dispute disputes are much more common in relation to agency um, uh, contracts. In distribution, is normally the notice period if it has not been agreed upon. But with agents, I, I see a number of, of different issues. Um, one I've seen a few times recently is basically that under the directive, you um, as an agent have a right to um, receive quite detailed information about the sales that the principal has made, uh, of course, for you to be able to calculate, you know, the commission you've earned. Yep. And I've seen quite a few cases where that that um, information was not uh, su uh, supplied on time or in sufficient detail. And then sometimes, you know, we've had to write letters to the principal um, and they have just refused to, uh, to supply it. Sometimes the contract has been terminated for that reason. Also by the agent because they said well, if you will not supply uh, supply me with that information, I'm enti entitled to terminate. Um, so I've seen a few few uh, issues with that, and I think even though you have um, a right under the the uh, the directive, which is which is um, which is uh, mandatory, uh, meaning that even though you've not put it into your contract, you still have the right because it it follows from a mandatory uh, provision. Uh, then I think it's still a good idea to be very specific on on what information you should receive and when and how, um, and also your right to to um, to sort of audit that information. I think those those are very uh, uh, very important rights of the agent, uh, which you should you know pay some extra attention to. Um, and if we are to consider the sort of the, the viewpoint of a principal. Then you know sometimes you will see that an agent um, replaces another agent, or that the principal has already himself been active on the market, which means that there could be a customer base there. So um, then it would be a very good idea to specify in the contract what are the existing customers, what are their their purchases, what is the turnover on those customers, so that once the 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 agreement is terminated with the agent you can argue that the agent is not entitled to to um to any sort of uh, compensation related re relating to getting those customers and also you have a benchmark as to whether they have expanded business with these customers so you can sort of take that out of the calculations and thereby making it easier for you to reduce the claim um uh, the the indemnity or the goodwill compensation claim uh, from the agent. Uh, very good point, and uh, this is true, of course, for all uh, uh, agency agreements. So that yes. that's a that's a good tip uh, to keep in mind. Uh, speaking of uh, issues that tend to come up um, uh, frequently, 
what is the uh, dispute resolution mode that you normally advise your clients to uh, insert in a distributorship or in an agency contract with, uh, well, between a foreign manufacturer, principal, yes. and a local agent or distributor? Yes. Uh, well, I would say there, there are two main issues that I consider before giving any recommendations to my client. One is, um, what is sort of uh, the expected values to be involved in this, uh, this contract? Because it is, it is uh, unless it's it's sort of a more significant uh, value, then I mean arbitration is usually more expensive. So you should only use arbitration if 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 you have sort of values below or above a certain point. So that is one thing. The other thing is name, name I would say, sorry. Name, yeah. Give me a figure that is normally your reference. Yeah, yeah, I would say that unless you expect the value to be more than a hundred thousand euros at least, okay, then you should not go to arbitration. Maybe you will even want to go higher than that before you do that. Yep. Um, of course, that's just going to be an estimate at the beginning of 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 the contract, of course. But but I think that should be considered. The other thing that I always say, and maybe I should have even mentioned that first, is that. When you advise on dispute resolution, you always have to consider as a very first point, where is your counterparty situated, domicile? Because at the end of the day, if you win a lawsuit or uh, um, uh, um, an arbitration, uh, arbitration uh, process, then it is not worth anything to your client unless you can enforce that towards the other party, right? So you have to consider that if you use the ordinary courts in Denmark, if the other party is domiciled in, within the EU, well, then we have then we have the Brussels regulation to take care of that. So that's that's perfect. You can do that. Uh, but if if the other party is, is domiciled outside the EU, then it is probably wise to do arbitration because then under the New York convention, you can enforce that. Um, and of course you should check for that country specifically, but, um, but I mean, it's 190 countries or something that, are, that have ratified the New York convention. So you're pretty safe to say that that is very likely that it's going to be enforceable against the other party. Uh, but of course, you know, check it in advance, but, but the, but I think those, those are the two, Sort of main considerations one more thing i would mention though is is at, at present i mean the danish i mean you know how long it takes to go through how long does the process take right and with i mean my experience is that arbitration is very effective usually you would get a decision with just within six months and it's it's a final decision so it cannot be appealed so i mean that that has certain advantages of course if you lose we wouldn't do that, but other people might lose and they may want to appeal. You cannot do that within within the arbitration. Um, but I think also actually within the last you know six to twelve months, uh, the, the, the 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 process before the ordinary courts has been reduced quite a lot because basically we have too few uh, few judges right at the, at this point uh, to go to court. So it may take a bit longer these days, which of course. If you are the person who believe you, that you are entitled to some kind of payment, it's quite frustrating. Um, I can say I just have uh, I've just had a letter from the from one of the high courts. We have two high courts in Denmark. Uh, that's not a distribution matter, but but anyway, I mean, and that was we uh, we have scheduled one full day of court, and I was offered to go to court uh, at the end of this year, which is you know quite okay, like six, seven, eight months from now. But I hear from others that. That sometimes it it you know takes more than than a year or even you know one and a half years before that you get a date and then sometimes you don't get a date until you've exchanged sort of the initial pleadings and stuff so you could be looking into one and a half to two years which I know in in some countries is not a lot but it's 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 a it's it's longer for Denmark than one we're used to um, yeah so well it's still still reasonable from the Italian viewpoint uh, I know. To two years uh no we have we have a denmark uh you probably he have heard about that too but we have a, a, a sort of a, a, a litigation strategy called the italian torpedo 
oh, yeah. meaning that if you can, you know, file a lawsuit in Italy and make all other courts in the EU unable to handle that case, you know, yeah. you have secured your, yourself ample time to. <laughs> yeah, to, that, uh, that that really depends on where you file uh, that lawsuit in Italy, because, if, for instance, in in my hometown jurisdiction, time would be kind of in line with uh, what it is in Denmark. So it yeah. could be a not too effective torpedo. It really depends on where. Yeah, you yeah. Or you shoot the torpedo. Okay, maybe the final, final question for you, Peter, would be how about mediation, which is uh, a alternative dispute resolution method that is gaining more and more traction uh, here in Italy and also here in other markets. Do you see it? Do you use it often? Do you recommend it as a maybe as an initial step before jumping into arbitration or state court? Uh, how, how's the situation um, in Denmark? Personally, I mean, in Denmark, you can basically do uh, mediation in two different ways. Well, many different ways, but there are two sort of main sort of areas where it's used. You can do sort of mediation with an institute for that. Yeah. But actually, um, the Danish courts, as part of their process, the ordinary courts, they always ask the parties, do you want mediation as part of this process? And if if both parties agree to that, it's voluntary, but if both parties agree, then the court will appoint uh, an, a mediator to see if they can solve the, the the issue before they get sort of into the to the details of of uh, of, of uh, litigation. Yep. And sometimes it's going to be another judge than the one who's dealing with it, or it can be an attorney who's been appointed uh, as a mediator for for the for the for the court. And I have only done mediation within the framework of the court not with this separate institute um and 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 i think my experience is 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 quite okay actually i mean uh sometimes you have i mean you should be able to sometimes you should be able to solve the the matter amicably even before going to court but sometimes that's not possible you have to file the claim once you've done that the other part sees that you're serious and then they are more willing to discuss the settlement and i think in those situations um it, it, it can be quite helpful to to do this mediation uh, and you can do a quick settlement. I've done that uh, quite a few times. I think my hit rate is around 50%. So in 50%, we'll be able to settle. And in the other 50%, we've had to continue with, with litigation, right? Yeah. So I think if, I think usually if if both parties are reasonable, I think it, it can be a good way to solve matters and then uh, do it quickly and then settle the matter and then, you know, get on with with your life and with business. Yeah, okay. Well, yes, it's my experience that uh, it can be very effective, especially in distribution agreements where maybe some issue uh, pops up, uh, unexpected or unforeseen in the contract, and the parties uh, actually would like to keep working together. So mediation can be can find ways to preserve the relationship uh, instead of negotiating a termination with an indemnity you find ways around it and, and keep the relationship going, which is at the end of the day, what's important for the parties. So maybe um, we can go back and, and share a few practical cases on this. Uh, I discussed this with Ignacio Alonso, for instance, who's very yes. also keen, keen to uh, share ideas. Maybe we can go back and, um, and dedicate a, a talk to absolutely absolutely i know uh, i know ignacio he's a very very experienced uh spanish lawyer within distribution yeah so absolutely we can do that cool so we can wrap up at this point thanks a lot peter for sharing your views and i look forward to continuing maybe again on the topic of mediation soon absolutely I'd be happy absolutely. To.